Hello, BookTube. Well, as you can see, I have a guest. <laughs> this is Jimmy Nuts from the Fantasy Network. Care to say hi to my imaginary BookTube friends? <laughs> well, hello, imaginary BookTube friends. I'm uh, I'm happy to be here, Steve. I feel like I just talked to you the other day. Yes, indeed. We're, we're both of us binding our wounds and treating them with iodine from our, my first appearance on the Fantasy Network. Oh, boy, the fur flew. <laughs> There, there were some, there were some flames. There was it definitely was some hilarious, and I didn't think. I think I mentioned to you. I didn't think to look back at the video to look at the comments on the video until one of my own viewers said, "You know, you should go and look at those comments." And I did, and I had a hilarious exchange with a viewer where we were just backing, back going back and forth. I, I, I emailed her and said. Can you believe some of the people in those comments field were calling me condescending? And she said, I know, you're never condescending. And I said, can you believe some of the people in that comments field were calling me self-righteous? And she said, I know, you're almost never self-righteous. And I said, can you believe some of the people in those comments were calling me narcissistic? And there was just crickets. <laughs> <laughs> hey, oh. Two out of three ain't bad. <laughs> eventually she just sort of sheepishly said well <laughs> sometimes you are a bit narcissistic <laughs> my only defense is that the most narcissistic moment in that conversation of ours was provoked by you you asked me what i thought of dostoevsky if yes. you were, if your name were printed on the cover of a copy of dostoevsky i bet you'd have shown it to me i mean i definitely would have and that blew me away i had no idea that you were on the cover of i mean that blew me away i thought that was so cool <laughs> it's my only slim excuse but but it, it, i don't have a, a name for interviewing people here on this channel <laughs> but i consider it fascinating i want to ask you a bunch of questions about booktube okay about your interaction with booktube for those of you who are watching my channel who don't stray into the fantasy realm of book of booktube fantasy channels um the fantasy network is seminal to that network of channels is no matter how self-deprecating jimmy nuts is himself everybody there knows him and he knows everybody there and everybody who's anybody shows up on the fantasy network <laughs> i'm chatting with nuts although maybe its reputation has now been sullied I, wow. I, if anything i think it just drove engagement i think people were coming out of the woodwork <laughs> yeah, who is this watch <laughs> their love or disdain for for the episode no i thought it was a great episode i mean we we went back and forth we had a good time we had good rapport and um and i think even people who got disgruntled were entertained at the very least right the only the only defense i can give to people who are disgruntled when i give interviews like that is pay attention to the interviewer if the interviewer is laughing his head off and having a ball, then maybe nothing nefarious is going on here. But before we get to book two, I want to go even farther back. I want to know your origin story as a reader. As a reader? Okay. Yes. Is that foregrounds? Book two? Obviously, you're not doing gaming streaming here. You're talking about books. Yeah, Something well. virtually nobody cares about. <laughs> nobody in the world reads, but you're on book two. <laughs> well, unfortunately. You read as a child? Yes, I did. So um, my, my parents always were very encouraging about reading. And strangely enough, you know, the things I, I remember reading first, um, other than like Goosebumps, um, you know, because my dad would read those to me and my mom and I would read them and try to read them at the time. Um, but I was like a late bloomer to reading. And I remember everyone was learning how to read in like second grade. And I struggled really bad. And it's not that I didn't want to. I wasn't a bad kid. I was very smart. I was in the advanced track, you know, but I just couldn't figure out how to read. And then when I finally learned how to read was around fourth grade, like early fourth grade. So I was really late to the party. Wait, you're but saying it, you, you couldn't figure out how to like it or you couldn't do it? I couldn't do it. I had a lot of trouble. Uh, part of that was that I needed glasses and my, like my teacher, was like he needs glasses. And like, we just didn't get it, you know, didn't get it handled. You know, th things weren't too pressing back then. So like I couldn't see the board half the time, but anyways, whenever I finally learned how to read, it like unlocked something for me. I was like, this is a superpower. Like I can read all these stories. And I remember like going into um, the elementary library and reading uh, Tom Hardy and Nancy Drew. And I don't remember anything about the stories except that I loved them. And then I remember reading uh, the boxcar children and then reading where the red fern grows, which I think every single person has read at this point. And I just, uh, I fell in love with reading that way. And Harry Potter was really big whenever I was in elementary school. So oh, we wow. actually, 
died. Some about brooms. I don't know. People like. So, so you were a confirmed reader before you even got to high school? Yeah. I, and that's the thing. I, I was such a late bloomer to reading, but by the time I was in fifth grade, they had me reading at like a senior level. And I was in like the gifted classes and whatnot, which I ended up getting kicked. You know, I, I didn't last long there because I also happened to enjoy, uh, you know, pro wrestling and and things that gifted kids don't usually do. So I'd like talk smack during the chess matches. You're not supposed to do that. They don't like that. Um, so I uh, yeah, I loved reading. And then, uh, you know, what, probably the biggest thing for me is, you know, like every other fantasy reader in the world. Uh, was the first two to three Harry Potter books. Then I fell off. Lord of the Rings was huge. I remember going to Walden books with my dad after seeing the movies and getting the book and being like, these books are nothing like the movies. What is going on? <laughs> you know, like these you, you came to the books after the movies. Yeah, I was 11 or 12 when the first movie came out and I tried to tackle uh, Lord of the Rings. And then I read Hobbit, loved Hobbit, and then put Lord of the Rings to the side after reading like half a fellowship. Uh, but strangely enough, Steve, the thing that I think made me like truly love, love reading was a teenage uh, like sports drama author named Carl Duker, who is he, he wrote out of Seattle and he always based his stories about high school boys playing sports that were like trying to do their best in Seattle. And I thought it was just the greatest thing in the world. I remember crying in my seventh grade class reading Heart of the Champion by Carl Duker when the star pitcher boy dies in a drunk driving accident and i'm sitting there just weeping at 13 and people are like what's wrong with him you know everyone else is faking their book reports i'm like i'm in yeah why is that uh i don't know why would it why would that of all things have such emotional power you know, I don't know. I think one of the biggest things that Carl Duker did was the coming of age. And and whenever you're 13, you're really confused. At least I was. I was I did not understand my place in the world. I wasn't really like my my family, we were definitely like on the poorer side of things. So I didn't fit in in a lot of places and then reading a story about a kid who also does not fit in and is best friends with the star player who ends up passing, right? So it's written from the, Yes, it's written from instead of the pitcher's perspective, it's written from the catcher's perspective, who is kind of forgotten. You know, he's just catching the ball. No one really thinks about him, but the pitcher knows his value. And uh, I don't know, it like spoke to me. And, and then I just read the rest of his stuff. And uh, man, that that's Carl Duker is what made me really fall in love with reading. So, yeah. so you mentioned that, you, that when you were when you were that age, when you were uh, you were first feeling this omnivorous hunger for books. You mentioned that you, your family's on the poorer side. So what about acquiring books? Was that a uh, drop or was it a library thing? Or So it was always the school, which uh, I told you in this, our, our stream, my, the school district I went to has just gotten rid of the libraries. And I have a friend who teaches there and he got me uh, one of the Carl Duker books that I checked out with the library card and gave it to me last year. And I, it's my favorite thing anyone's ever gifted me. Uh -huh. I, it means the world to me. It's falling apart too. I, I, it's downstairs where I'd show it off, but um, yeah, libraries. And then we had one in my small town and I remember going there and that's wherever I read Stephen King for the first time. And I remember I checked out it and I was like 11 or 10 and the librarian made me call my mom and be like, can he read this? And my mom's like, I don't care. Like whatever. <laughs> and then I read it. I got scared and didn't sleep for two days. And my dad's like, you're returning that book. Like you're not reading that anymore. We can't have you up all night. Um, so yeah, libraries were absolutely fundamental to me having access to books. Wow. That's going to please the librarians who are listening. That's yeah. for sure. <laughs> Go librarians. Important to remember <laughs> the library served that function for lots and lots of people. Yeah. So uh, I have uh, two splitting strands of further questions. I want to ask about, you know, the move of little Jimmy to high school. But first, before I forget, I want to ask, what about the change from that circumstance to being able to buy your own books? Do you remember that? Did, did, oh. did, did it strike you? Yeah. So for me, going to the bookstore was like, uh, like a special event because like we didn't buy a lot of books all the time. And a lot of times we went to like, um, like book fairs. They did use book fairs at, at this old huh. mall. It was like where like, you know, the, the mall was definitely on its way out. I think I don't even know if it's still open anymore, but people would just bring in crates of books that they found in, in their grandpa's house or whatever. And I remember picking up a bunch of like biographical, I, I don't want to say they were autobiographies, but they're like biographies about like Johnny Unitas 
uh, Joe Namath and old football players. And I read those. I loved football when I was young and I just ripped through those. Um, so for me, I, I still prefer to go get the books that way. And I remember whenever I finally had money and I was like, I can go buy books. I still went to the used book fairs and I still did a books or um, there, there was another one back in the day, but you know, I still preferred I still prefer to use books every time. And just in the last three or four years, I started buying brand new books. Like that is kind of still newish to me because I didn't ever feel like I was in a position where I could just go splurge on books. Uh, and now I'm starting to kind of collect books like rare editions. It's kind of a thing, but that's like almost separate to reading. I'm sure, as oh, yeah. I'm sure you know. It um, is absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, kind of thing. it's part of the reason why I go to job to go to work, not just pay my mortgage, but to, <laughs> so I can buy these books. <laughs> So in the present day, do you have a book buying budget? Um, I would say no. Estimate it. I I don't want to. <laughs> don't want to know. <laughs> don't want to know. I told you I just bought that Conan edition. I was like, oh, it's like sixty bucks, you know. And it, I spent a lot of money on books. There's no doubt about it. I probably I I probably don't have nearly as many as a lot of other people. Um, but I have I would say probably like four hundred books or so. In, in my house and, and some of them are my on my wife's as well she she reads um a lot of her reads are books i will not read but you know hmm so so just to just to finish up on this i promise i have other things to ask about so a new book comes across your horizon not a collectible item mm -hmm. but just a, a new thing that's out there that you want will you buy it new or do you look around for a deal I usually I usually try to look around for a deal. So uh, especially if I'm going to go to like one of the big box places, I like to buy it local when I can. Uh, it's it's kind of tough around here. We talked a little bit before, but like there's not great options for cell phone stores around here or family owned. Uh, so I always wait till I get one of those like 20% off your purchase things. And then I will go and try to get the most value I possibly can. But there are times where I just buy things um, straight up. Like if I know I want to, like for instance, uh, Tearing of Faith is the second book. I can't remember the series is called, but it's by Richard Swan. And he's a newer author. I wanted to support him first and foremost. And secondly, I knew I was going to read a book. So i um, hoping to read that actually fairly soon. So it just depends, but I, I don't rush out and buy new releases very often. So, so bookish Jimmy goes to high school. Then what happens? I'm kind of wondering in in stories like this that I hear from people where they're ardent readers when they're young, often there's a weird dip, a weird yep. dry period where that goes away. Yep. Did that happen to you? Yep, sure did. Yeah, absolutely. Um, for me, it was less that I didn't want to read, but there was just new things in the horizon. I I feel like people in my generation and my age had this boom of the internet and video games and online video games where it was like so new and like this is a crazy thing that we that we have the capability of doing and it was just like you had to be a part of it kind of thing you know and reading just fell to the wayside for a few years and uh, when i got back into reading um as as a you know 20 something year old i actually did a lot of nonfiction. i was doing physics books and i was also doing biographies again uh, and that type of thing. And it, a lot of times I, I traveled a lot. So a lot of it was audio booking, which I had never done in my life until that point. So I, that's kind of how I got introduced to audio booking. But yeah, I definitely fell away for like five years, probably. So all of high school? I would say, yeah, I would say um, probably 10th grade on. And I probably didn't pick up a book again until I was maybe 21, maybe 22. Yeah. Long time, right? That is, that is yeah. a long time. Yeah. It almost rare that it would happen, that it would come back to you. Yes, very rare. But so, I, I mean, do you feel the same all consuming excitement about it that you used to? Did that oh, come as well? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Way, way, way more, way more. Because, way more. Oh. Yeah, especially because of the thing that we're doing right now, which is talking. Uh, you know, I never really talked about books I read. Uh, that wasn't a thing. It was a solitary activity. And I liked it for that, to be honest with you. I like shutting myself in and kind of just, you know, doing my own thing. But, you know, and you talk to other readers and you talk to people who are really into the things you're into or not into the things you're into. I feel like you just learn. And I just have become a better reader. And then that way I can challenge more difficult stuff. 
uh, or I can, you know, I can tackle it and I can experience all different types of stories. That's one thing. I am the fantasy network and I do love science fiction and fantasy, but I try to read more than just that. And, and I'm not the most wide read person in the world, but I'm trying, I'm trying to get better at that. I have a wide palette. I, I, I like a lot of things. So I think actually probably just as much as whenever I was just devouring those Carl Duker books where I couldn't put them down. I still feel that for sure. Well, the talking about books is a natural segue to booktube, isn't it? It is. <laughs> Do you remember when you first became aware of something of an area of YouTube devoted to books? Yes. And I can tell you the exact function it served and why I, I can, I remember we, and this is kind of like when I finally started having money to buy books. And I remember me and my wife, instead of getting gifts for each other for Christmas, we, we always just go shopping together and we just spend the day together. We turn off our phones and we just buy the things that we want to buy. And it's like in the middle of the week, we take a day off work. We like it better than presents because then we get what we wanted anyways, right? Saves money, saves a lot of disappointment. <laughs> so we just do it this way, right? And I remember walking by Barnes and Noble and I looked inside and I just have always loved bookstores. And I looked in and I said, God, there's so many books. I want to read, but there's so many books in there. And you know, most of them suck. And I was like, a book is such a big, like if a Netflix show sucks, I lost an hour of my time at best. And then I DNF the show, not a big deal. But if I go in and spend $26 on a new book and I get 20 hours into reading it, because the time I, I read very slowly, like that sucks. Like that, that could ruin reading for you. It really could. Um, I've had that plenty of people have told me that story in fantasy. They pick up the wrong, not the wrong fantasy book, but the wrong fantasy book for them starting out. And then they, they say fantasy is not for me. And it's like, no, 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 this genre is plentiful and beautiful. Like there's so much to experience. So that was it. And I remember my wife said, well, there's probably people online like who do these things and tell you. And I was like, yeah, it's probably a good idea. And then I saw Daniel Green and then I saw Mike's book review. And I was like, oh, there are people out there that are reading fantasy. And obviously like Game of Thrones has been instrumental. And at that point I had read the, uh, those books, right? And I was hoping to find something else like that. And all the fantasy books were yay big. So I needed someone to vet them out for me. <laughs> and that, that, was, this, that was the function of BookTube for me. And it's a beautiful service. You never thought of the Boston Globe or the Washington Post. You never thought of book critics. I didn't think any of those. I, 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 I was ignorant to it. I didn't think any of those publications probably reviewed fantasy. I had no idea. They don't. I, I was just yeah, wondering. Well, yeah, see, perfect. I was wondering perfect. if book critics came into this at all. <laughs> Apparently not. <laughs> well, it's still a lovely story. <laughs> If only there were somebody to sort out whether yeah, it's just a shame. Worth their time or not. If only there were a name for that profession. <laughs> okay, someone should really get on that. Okay, so the natural next question there, the natural next step. Everybody that's listening had something like that moment that you're just describing. Mm -hmm. Is there are there people out there who are talking about the books that I either like or maybe wonder about? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you find those people, and through them you find other people who they recommend, who the algorithm props up for you. But at some point, a radical new idea happens, which is that I could be one of those people. I could do this myself. Mm -hmm. Well, that doesn't happen to everybody. Most people who watch videos never even think about making them. What made it so with you? Uh, well, one, I yearn to entertain people. It's just something I've always wanted to do. Um, I also have this thing where, like, I can't seem but to help myself to stumble into communicating with people. And it's weird because I'm a bit of a hermit. Uh, yeah. I don't do a lot of stuff, but for some reason I'm, I'm, I think it's part of being human is that we just want to belong to something bigger than ourselves. And this was something that I felt like I could be a part of. And <laughs> well, if that's part of being human, then you're ruling out introverts, which I would mostly agree with. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like I'm that intro extrovert people talk about. It, it, it's a strange <laughs> feeling. I can't really describe it, but I just decided. And at the time in the fantasy sphere, it was not as plentiful as it is right now. 
And I said, you know, I feel like I am well-spoken. I'm not well-read, but I am well-spoken. And I think people might be able to relate to me because I'm trying to find the next best stuff. And really the whole channel idea was to find the next Song of Ice and Fire because I love the Song of Ice and Fire so much. And I read series at the beginning of my channel that people had recommended on Reddit or like forums that, you know, these are the ones you should read if you like a Song of Ice and Fire. And I basically just went through and judged them accordingly like that. And uh, then I became just in a different mindset. I said, I just really like reading again. And I also particularly like learning more about this genre. And it became less about comparing to a Song of Ice and Fire or anything and just finding, you know, new favorites in a new way type deal. Yeah. And it, that's, it just it's, you're never going to find the next song of ice and fire that that's exactly correct you, you just have to abandon that quest it's not a, yes. it's not a fair quest anyway it's not fair but it's not fair. but there had to be a leaping off moment right did that give you butterflies wondering okay i've decided that i'm going to do this that i'm going to make a channel what if no one's there right this is this is leaping into the dark point for most people yeah I, uh, I definitely felt that. I remember, I, I'll never forget this. I, I, I had my camera and I was just yelling into the camera about why you should still read A Song of Ice and Fire even though season eight sucked. And I was just yelling into the camera <laughs> and I, I was out of breath and I, I was like, and I said out loud, I said, why the hell am I doing this? <laughs> and I said, well, like all Song of Ice and Fire fans, uber fans, <laughs> absolutely mortified by that final season. Yes, think of all the thousands of people in the world who don't know the books. They watched oh, that yeah. final season, and it, all of them turned away from the TV and said, "This whole series stinks." Yeah, yeah. The Song uh, of Ice and Fire fanatics out there are saying, "No, no, don't." And that was me, right? I, I was someone who loved the books, and I was like, "There's still so much more, even without the ending. Like, there's still so much more, and so much that deviated, yada yada yada." And that was it. I was like, you know what? If anything, I'll just be passionate. And my first video was bad, but it was passionate. And people started watching and I, I cringe at some of those, um, some of those early reviews and stuff, because I wasn't aware of how much I wasn't aware of and saying things like this could be like a new best thing. And it's like, well, what does that even mean? You haven't read anything, dude. <laughs> and it's funny, the more I read the less sweeping statements I've made. And I try to pretty much stick away from sweeping statements because uh, who am I? I'm just like a moron with a microphone, you know, like, um, which isn't good because usually it, it pays to be, you know, confident. <laughs> you, the passion excuses a lot of sins. Yes. <laughs> I don't think I don't think many people are going to are going to care about that. But you did find an, an optimistic reception, an enthusiastic yeah. reception. Yeah. What was that like? Did you? Yeah. I, I'm assuming there was no conscious casting around for what can I do that nobody else is doing. None. None. Okay. Uh, and, and to be honest, still, that's not in my thoughts. Um, every now and then I get I get a, like a little twinge and I'm like, I want to try something different. But at the end of the day, this was like done as something just to to communicate with people and to have fun. And that's all I wanted to get out of it. And I just wanted to talk to people about books. And it's been incredible, man. Uh, I, I've met some of my new best friends through this and I found so many great books that have changed my perspective on things. And uh, it's just a net positive overall. You know, it's just, See, I, I, that phrase I always use, it's just a net yeah. positive. Yeah. It's all there is to it. It's a way for you to, to reach out comparatively little effort and add something completely positive to your life. Yep. Unless you're an introvert. Although booktube has plenty of introverts. <laughs> the nice thing about doing booktube as an introvert is that there's no one else in the room. You know, you're, and, and to me, that's awkward. Like I, so, you know, I, I would rather someone be in the room with me. It's whenever I'm alone and not doing something like this and I'm yelling at my camera, I always feel so weird, but now, you know, it's been, it's been a few years, so I don't really mind it anymore, but I struggled with that at first. Uh, but you get over it. I wouldn't know. I'm rather fond of the sound of my own voice. <laughs> it's, it's, Very narcissistic. It's a problem for me. <laughs> Plus, I'm really old. So I do these uh, acapella monologues even when the camera's not running. <laughs> so I might as well just film them. <laughs> <laughs> so so a, a cheesy question then to mm -hmm. maybe follow up on this, because I agree with you completely. And it's a net positive. It's just mm -hmm. it's just a net a, a positive way to add something to your life, especially if you're bookish. Yeah. Uh, but the, the cheesy question that follows is, you know, about the future. 
when you when you do a booktube video or uh, you know a month of them do you think about you know, what what will you be doing uh, none of us can know for sure but what will you be doing will you still be doing this in a year do you have do you to use a uh, corporate interview speak do you have goals <laughs> for, I, your, for your channel i don't think i have any goals anymore um and this is something i've wrestled with like recently thinking about like you know what kind of stuff do I want to make in the future? But I will say this, the reason, one of the reasons why I got back into reading like heavily. And one of the reasons why I did book two that I didn't mention is the fact that I had a very severe knee injury that for, you know, everyone gets humbled at some, at some point in your life. And I realized I wasn't Superman. And I was like, I need to find something that's mentally stimulating because my mind is going to hold up a lot longer than my body is going to. And for me, the idea of a book channel was I can do this for the rest of my life. Like I can literally do this until I'm dead. And I have an internet connection, hopefully, right? So that was part of the thing. So I've always kind of just assumed I will do this forever. In what capacity and what volume of that, that's that's to be determined. Uh, actually, right now, I'm kind of in this mode where I think I'm pretty much just going to start doing wrap-ups and chatting with nuts. Because chatting with nuts is really what people seem to gravitate towards for my channel. Uh, I do have reviews that have done you know well over time. But I have found myself feeling less inspired to do those um, for multiple reasons. But uh, I think what this is or what I'm doing with it is going to fluctuate. And I hope that I can maintain the fun so I can just do it for the next, I don't know, I'll probably make it like another 30 years tops. So let's, let's hope. <laughs> well, chatting with nuts plays into your strengths. Definitely. Thank you. You could build new strengths, obviously, with with reviewing or overviews or the tier mm -hmm. videos, the fantasy videos, <laughs> fantasy booktubers love so much. Top 10 fantasy books that are fantasy. What? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, chatting with nuts plays into your strength. You are, you are uh, that, that wonderful thing when the, the viewer automatically identifies with the host. That, that is wonderful. That if you can get that, if you can do that for an interview, that works wonders something i've uh i appreciate that i it's something i've always loved uh whenever i used to travel a lot i loved talking to people at truck stops or at diners because i travel by myself a lot of the time and i love just meeting people and talking to them and making them feel comfortable and learning something you know and to do that with the basis of like we both like books we might not like the same books but we like books it's even easier so i think you can look right down the line of for instance media interviewers and mm -hmm. see the difference between the ones where the viewer does not identify with the interviewer versus the ones where they do when it when it's someone like when it's an interviewer that the viewer does not identify with then they automatically want the interviewer to be humbled to be humiliated by the guest in some way <laughs> they have to side with somebody if they can't side with david letterman and who could they're going to side with his guest whereas they're definitely going to side with johnny carson no matter what the guest is the bad guy yeah <laughs> if they misbehave at all they're the bad guy uh which i realize now is awkwardly segueing into our own chatting with nuts episode <laughs> how awkward mm. <laughs> oh my <laughs> that's not good <laughs> let's pull away from that as fast as possible <laughs> so you okay so you're thinking maybe concentrate on what people like and what what you feel like doing Yes. What about new ideas? Uh, I would like to, at some point in this to make content that is somewhat informational. I, I would like, I feel like I've acquired a lot of knowledge from talking to so many people about various authors or, or other things that are bookish. And I would like to take those and stick them in like 10 minute videos and inform people about them, uh, specifically around A Song of Ice and Fire, because I just know so much about it because that's like my obsession. So uh, at some point, I would like to get the, the motivation to do that. I just don't know when that'll be. <laughs> A series of, of uh, basic introductory stuff about a song of ice and fire what is it what is each book what are the plots who are the characters oh my that would be evergreen you yeah. would have people flocking to that for years that that's an it but what about uh, just before we finish up here what about interviewing more mainstream authors as long as i like their books <laughs> well i don't i don't want uh, Zoom to cut us off in mid-syllable here, so uh, we'll, uh, we'll just wrap things up. Uh, uh, 
by uh, I'll leave all of your info down below. But this is this has been wonderful. Of course, we will we will uh, hang a big to be continued sign on this until the next time I show up on chatting with nuts. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> and this time you should add a parental advisory. <laughs> Warn people. 